Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here. Today I want to chat with you guys a little bit about understanding how to incorporate things like speed work, explosive low rep sets for high volume, for hypertrophy, and, and other benefits. But people need to understand, when I talk about some of these advanced concepts and some of the stuff I'm using right now, even in my own training, people will say, oh my gosh, this contradicts what you tell us all the time. No, no, people don't understand. This is not about base building. This is not for people who are still building their base. This is for people who are already strong, people who have already finished out all their new gains, right? Like people who've gained at least 15 plus pounds of drug-free muscle from where they started. I don't mean 15 pounds of body weight, I mean 15 pounds of solid muscle, right? If you're still working towards getting to a 315 or a three plate aside squat, you can't pause bench two plates aside, right? can't deadlift 400 pounds. Uh, this stuff is not going to work for you. This is for people who already have a base. A lot of the information that I put out there is for novice lifters. When I talk about you guys need to get strong, taking longer rest times, focus on your basic lifts. You don't even need to be doing things like concurrent periodization. You guys probably don't even need to do curls other than I throw them in programs in some cases. You probably don't need that stuff. You don't need assistance movements. I would rather someone who still needs to build a base, and maybe you might still have been training for three years and still not have a base because you didn't train correctly. I would rather that person stick to just some slow, basic linear programming, stick to their basic lifts. You don't need box squats. You don't need floor presses. Right? You, you don't need these things. You don't need to be thinking about some of these advanced concepts. In fact, it could slow you down to even worry about this stuff. So if that's you, this is, this is a video that's interesting to listen to, but you don't need to take everything on board that we're talking about. So when we understand how these concepts work, we can talk about how they work, why they work, and why I might even do them, but I'm also a master's lifter. I'm older, I already have a base, and I'm, you know, again, had detrained a bit and other things, and I'm working on athleticism, body composition, all this other stuff in my 40s, all right? You guys have seen me already hit 500 plus pound squats on camera. We, we've seen all this stuff. You guys have seen me rep out over 500 pounds on a deadlift for reps, for just normal rep work. All right, I would rather novice lifters build their base. Be strong on your basic lifts. Now, if you have a good strength base, this stuff works really well because it allows us to get a lot of training density with explosive quality reps. Remember what I was saying in the first video I did discussing the dynamic work uh, on the orc mode talking again? I was explaining to people that when you're working with something like this, like 80%, around 80%, of a training max. For triples, normally that's going to be about a seven rep max. Well, we know that under normal rep tempo is only about five reps before failure give a training effect. That, that's pretty well established in the literature. So if you're working with a 10 rep max, you don't really start stimulating adaptation till around rep six. If you're working with a six rep max, the first rep probably isn't stimulating adaptation because you're not hitting the upper threshold fibers. You have to build a certain amount of fatigue to reach that. However, when we are dealing with external cueing, meaning compensatory acceleration, exploding a weight as hard as you can while maintaining decent form. Again, you're accelerating the weight as quickly as you can. It produces superior muscle fiber contractions with any given weight. Go back and look at the, the, the study. Again, the one I've cited multiple times. You've seen Greg Knuckles cited other people trying to say, hey, the mind-muscle connection is great. That's where they had lifters do three types of training with the bench press all using the same weight. They had one where they just went through the motions with that weight and they measured the, the tricep and the chest recruitment on an EMG. Then they had them focus on a mind-muscle connection on the chest, squeezing the chest, in which case the chest got better recruitment with the same weight. They got more activity. When they focused on squeezing the triceps, the triceps got better recruitment than when they didn't focus on anything, right? And that's used as an example, say, hey, the mind-muscle connection works. It got better muscle fiber recruitment. However, when they focused on exploding the weight as hard as they could, what happened? The triceps and the chest got better recruitment, and the recruitment was even better than on the individual mind-muscle connections for each one. So what does that tell us? That exploding a weight as hard as you can 
produces the highest quality muscle fiber recruitment on every rep. This can let us break the rule of getting within five because that's assuming moderate or slow reps. When we lift as fast as we can and we generate maximum force and we treat every rep like it's a one rep max, we get superior force production, we get superior muscle fiber recruitment, and we get the force production because of the muscle fiber recruitment. So, you know, what I would suggest if you're gonna train with this style of training, you squeeze the bar as hard as you can, you get tight and you explode angrily. Every rep, you press as hard as you would on a one rep max. And when you start mounting up a lot of doubles or triples, like let's say you do 10 sets of two this way, or you do eight sets of three, even with a weight that's like 80%. All right, we accumulate a lot of high quality reps. And we can do a fair amount of workload density. It can be done quickly because as I said before, if you're in shape, you don't see a reduction in performance with short breaks. Again, why do we take long breaks between sets on limit sets? So that you can recover between sets enough to move the same tonnage again. In other words, we know that uh, in studies that look at hypertrophy, like even if you're doing eight reps or 10 rep sets, that three minute breaks produce more hypertrophy than one minute breaks. That's been studied. Why? Because you can lift a heavier weight for 10 reps for three sets. If you take three minutes, you have to reduce the weight. Well, when you're training with accumulating fatigue on every set because you're doing 10 reps, you're being lazy with the first few and then you start hitting the upper threshold fibers later on, but you still have a tonnage component. With this, we're not doing limit sets. Therefore, we're not introducing enough fatigue that our muscles build the fatigue, right? Our nervous system is fatigued and the peripheral nervous system needs you know, 60 seconds, maybe 90 seconds to be ready to train again. And if you're in shape, the muscles will be ready to repeat that performance eight, nine, 10 sets. We're not seeing a degradation in performance and therefore we're not gonna see a real benefit from the shorter rest times. So this can actually be done relatively quickly. And we end up with tonnages, we end up with tonnages that are very much on par with as if we had done say three sets of 10, right? Because we're using a heavier weight than we would normally do 10 rep sets with, even doing this 80%. This is just using this as an example. You know, you're still doing 24 reps with, with uh, 80%. You might do three sets of 10, which would be 30 reps with something like 70 to 75% of your max. So this is still a heavier weight. We end up with very similar tonnages. So from a total fatigue perspective, which is what we look at for certain elements of volume and hypertrophy, it's pretty similar volume. However, from a neuromuscular efficiency perspective, we have exploded as hard as we can on every rep. So we have generated a more efficient nervous system. Also, what do we get more of? We get more first reps. And we get more second reps. The second rep is important. Why? On any given set with any given weight, we know that the second rep is usually capable of producing more activation on an EMG, right? That's usually your, your strongest set. We're getting more of our strongest rep, and I'm gonna correct that, I meant rep, not set. I'm not gonna edit that. We're getting that second rep in far more often. We're getting it like eight to 10 times, right? And we're getting more first reps. Why do the first reps matter? Well, it's gonna make you stronger to one rep max because you're practicing the setup more. You're practicing that initial rep, which is what you're gonna to have to do on a one rep max on any competitive lift. So if we're seeking maximum strength and we're seeking to be as explosive as we can, we're getting all of that from this training, but we are getting training volumes that look very much like traditional hypertrophy work. And accordingly, you find a lot of lifters grow off of this. I mean, I remember Chris Lovato telling me years ago at an expo when we were chatting a natural bodybuilder who he ran like the, the conjugate method for a while from West Side, and he noted that his back and a lot of his muscles in his body grew faster on that program than he did on bodybuilding programs. It's, it's the dynamic work because it is a maximum hypertrophy training style, but it masks itself as an athletic performance and explosive training style. It's really, it's a combination.
and done correctly, you can get tremendously jacked off of explosive low rep sets. They'll give you serious gains. All right, guys, so that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.